trouble was I wanted them financially, but he had burnt his bridges with everyone in terms of money. Not like you could buy him a plane ticket and he could go home because he couldn't go home with his passport. So all you could theoretically do was give him the money to pay the overstay, but there was no way you knew he was going to pay the overstay because people had tried to help him before. Of course, he'd just gone out, drunk it and ended up back on the beach. What's the story, everybody? Pete here from Tyres Times. Hope you're doing well out there. So today we're going to meet Simon, who featured on the channel about two months ago. And he's a, he's an expat in the Philippines currently, but he also spent seven years in Thailand. And Simon's going to tell three expat stories from his personal experience living abroad. The first one is about an expat who had a business for 18 years in Pattaya, Thailand, went broke, lost it all. It's a very sad story indeed. The second one is about a punch up in a place called Dumaguete in the Philippines. It was big on social media about six weeks ago. Uh, so he's gonna get into that one. And then the third one is Simon's experiences with a con man in Patia called Dave. And that's a good one as well. So we got a lot to cover in this video. I'll put timestamps in there for you. So if you wanna jump to a particular part of the video, you'll be able to do that. Also, I'm always looking for new content, folks. So if you know someone that has a good story or you have a good story yourself, get in contact with me, tirestimes at gmail.com. Get me on Instagram, tirestimes. And also, uh, if you want to support the channel, we've got channel membership set up as well. We've got extra content over there for you. Let's get straight into the video. Let's do it. Simon, thanks very much for coming on here again. So in the first interview, I said that there was two stories that we didn't cover because we had a kind of bad internet connection at the time. So we're going to get into those two stories today because they're really good, right? So and let's talk about Kevin, the bar owner in Pattaya, because there's an interesting story there. Yeah, that was a sad story because he it was his bar that I um, met David. He used to have a bar called the Easy Bar, which uh, was about the only place I drank in Pattaya, to be honest, because he was a good friend. The first time I went there, I didn't it didn't so long. I met him. I ended up living in the apartment next. He got me an apartment next door to him, and that so we we became really good friends. And um, he'd done quite well on the bar scene because he'd been there for eighteen years. His uh, I think his wife had well, I know his wife had died in an accident, and uh, he'd got compensation for it. I don't know how it happened to car crash or whatever. And he'd used the money to go over there, and he'd bought his bar. And he'd been there for 18 years when I met him. And there's not many bars that stay open as, uh, you know, that long in, in Patty and do okay. Um, as time had gone on, though, I mean, he'd changed because I saw pictures of him. He was quite a handsome young man, like a big bloke when I knew him. He had no teeth and he was grossly overweight. And he, he just, you know, he, he was an alcoholic. Um, and the business was, was, wasn't what it was. Um, he was just at me getting a thousand, uh, but at the end of the night, because he'd sit there drink all day and he'd get a thousand, but at two o'clock in the morning and he'd disappear and go and do whatever he did and, and that was it um and i knew him on and off like every three months when i'd go down for the visa runs or whatever i'd always go and see kevin and the bar started to get into trouble he was like complaining each time it wasn't making any money he wouldn't do this and i knew that the girls behind the bar were robbing him blind because i knew people were people and things but it's not the kind of thing you want to get involved in because his girlfriend ran the bar for him um, and then the last time I saw him when he had the bar, he asked me to come in and he wanted a ridiculously small sum of money. You know, I think the first time he mentioned it, he wanted like 25,000. By the last time he asked me, it was like 1,500. To, like, you know, in, to invest in the bar? He wanted me to buy half the bar. But, you know, you could tell by that stage, you know, if, if someone's asking for 20,000 three months before, then they're asking for 1,500, you know, you know the bar's going under. And I wasn't my interest. I don't want to work. You know what I mean? It wasn't my thing. Um, so I knew the bar was in trouble. I went back to Petroban. And then one day there was a thing on Facebook, someone had put this picture of um, Kevin and he was walking. It looked, I couldn't really tell if it was Kevin. It was the back of like a scruffy looking guy on the beach. And they had a GoFundMe page for him. So I said to my girlfriend, like, you know, because she showed it to me and we weren't sure if that was Kevin or not. So I was like, well, you know, like message some people and try and find out. Because she knew more people down there than I did. And uh, they said the bar had gone under. Um, and uh, he was living rough. Um, no way, I didn't think much of it. But that was about two months after that, I'd gone back to Uganda, that's when I split up with my girlfriend. So I went back to Thailand, but I went back to Pattaya. I thought I'll regroup there, I need to find somewhere else to live. That's, that's before I went to Bui Ram. So I go back to Pattaya, I know some people there. Not actually Pattaya, I was in Jontia. And when I got there, I went down, not the bar, that he used to have because that had gone 
but I went to the bar where his girlfriend was uh, working now. Um, and uh, I said, what's going on with Kevin and that? And she was like, oh, you've got to go. Don't stay here too long because Kevin will turn up because he comes every night asking for money from the girls and, you know, because he's homeless now and he lives on the beach and if you stay around, he's going to be asking for money off you. And I said, well, no, if, 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 if he's here, I'd like to see him. I'd like to help him if I can do. And sure, as soon he turned up about nine o'clock and he was smelling, just look rough, you know, whatever. So I said to him, look, you know, go and have a shower. And I gave him some money and I think I either told him to, uh, I either gave him the keys to my place or I gave him some money to go and get a hotel. I can't remember because he ended up staying at my place for a little while later on in in, 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 in the story. Um, but I can't remember that night. But anyway, so he got himself sorted out and then uh, he ended up probably a day because at that time he just got out of prison because they'd kept him in there because they'd arrested him for being a vagrant. And he was on like a 20 year overstay. And they basically, he had to pay a huge fine to get out of the country. Um, they're taking his passport and that, so he couldn't leave. But they let you out apparently to try and get the money together to pay the fine. If you can't get the money together the fine, they just put you back inside again. And this seems to be like a circle. But he was staying with his girlfriend, he had. So I didn't see him for a couple of days. And then I saw him again and I said, look, you, you move into, uh, you can move in with me. Um, and he stayed with me probably about a week. And like I was saying, Kevin, you've got to get out of here somehow. You've got to do, you know, you can't stay like this, you know, living on the thing and that. And the trouble was, I wanted to help him financially, but he had burnt his bridges with everyone in terms of money. And um, it's not like you could buy him a plane ticket and he could go home because he couldn't go home with his passport. So all you could theoretically do was give him the money to pay the overstay. But there was no way you knew he was going to pay the overstay because people had tried to help him before and of course he'd just gone out drunk it and ended up back on the beach and I don't think he really wanted to go I don't, you know he just seemed to want to stay there which I'll never understand I understand the life before was perfect for him and he wanted to maintain it but he wasn't maintaining it you know he was living rough you know having to beg for food and things constantly getting arrested and, you know because um, he's been going on for probably about six or seven months now at this stage um, but the trouble was, I'd got with this other girlfriend, and we were going to go to um, we were going to go to see him re in uh, Cambodia, and that had all been arranged. And I, much as I like Kevin, and much as I've been helping him for the time, I didn't want to leave him in the apartment myself because, to be honest, I didn't trust him, you know, with the TV and stuff like that because he was all right on a uh, on a short leash, but he, yeah, he was desperate for cash. So um, I found him at a cheap place on uh, on Second Road, and uh, I gave him the money. I think it was for three days because we were going to see him read for three days. And um, when I came back, he'd gone because um, I went to see him at the at the place, and he'd insisted on getting the money back off the hotel. People kicked up a fuss. He stayed one night, and then he'd um, he'd gone, um, and nobody knows what happened to him. Nobody knows what happened to him. Um, what do you think? Well, uh, the trouble is, you know, I've got a YouTube channel. A couple of people in the comments have told me he's back in the UK. But whether I believe that, I do not know. He's definitely not in prison, because when he'd been in prison before, he had made a point of phoning his ex-girlfriend and asking for help and all that. He wasn't the kind of guy who would not ask for help. So there's no way he'd gone back to prison and kept quiet all that time. If he died which is a strong possibility because he was not in good shape. Um, I'm sure it would have made the Pattaya news or, or something like that. I mean, because, you know what I mean? If you die, I'm sure it's going to make some kind of paper and that. Um, so hopefully he got home, but I don't know how he could have got home, you know, because he didn't have the money to do that. But he literally did just disappear. Um, so as I said, when I put the video on my channel, whatever happened to him, I hope he's all right. But a couple of people messaged me and said he's back in wherever it is he's supposed to live. So I like, well, that's great to news. I messaged a couple of them saying, you got a contact number or anything? They haven't. So you think, well, how do they know he's back there then? <laughs> you know what I mean? But it was a strange one. He probably did make it back, but how he did it, God only knows, because, you know, he, he couldn't buy a ticket, didn't have a passport, didn't have enough money for the overstay fine. So, you know, how did he manage it? Let's talk about you in the Philippines then, right? So a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a lot of drama in a place called Dumaguete. Videos went 
round like wildfire. Everybody had an opinion on it. And then it got me thinking, you said in the first interview that you're very careful about the expats that you associate with. And then you made a video on your channel and you spoke about what went on in Dumaguete. We'll get into that in just a moment, but it kind of hammered home to me that, yeah, you do meet kind of clicky groups in when you're abroad as an expat, you know, Thailand, Philippines. And sometimes hanging around with a group can lead to bad things. People tend to fall out with each other. The only thing they really have in common with each other is, is they speak English or they speak whatever language they all speak. Let's hear your opinions on it. What do you think, you know, about the whole, the drama in, in Dumaguete? And then how does that kind of uh, go into how you believe about how you uh, associate with different expats abroad? Well, I, I have never been an expat kind of guy. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've got a few good expat friends over here and I do spend it, but I don't do the circles, the clicks. When I moved up to Petrobon, I was the only, I think it was one other guy, a Norwegian bloke. I never met him in our village. So when, but there weren't expats where we were in our village, but there were a few in the surrounding villages. And there was a place there called Homelands a Hotel. And they used to gather there on Sundays. Um, and uh, they, they used to have a few beers and that. Um, and I didn't like it straight away because you could see, basically the trouble is they're all thrown together. They only speak English. And when you've got a group of more than about, I don't know, eight or nine, they fall out of each other. Um, and then people take sides. And I'd seen that in Patio, you know, in like darts teams and ball teams. And you see it all around the world. So I, I, I never want to get involved in that. When I come here, there's a place called the Get Rep Bar where loads of expats go, the Australian expats, and they all sit around a bar all day, and they're very clicky. I, I stay away from there. Never been back since until I realised that. But the unusual thing about this lot in Dumaguete is they just spend their hours in a coffee shop. Now, most expats around the world, when you see these clicks, it all revolves around drinking and people fall out. But over here, none of them drink. They just, they just, they just, you know, drink coffee. But my God, they fall out. And my God, they're the most opinionated people in the world. I mean, they just, everyone, the second I did an interview for Mark Thornton, this guy's an alcoholic. And he's, and it's only because I said I like to go out the bars in the evenings. So they are a very, very, very clicky lot. Um, mainly Americans. A lot of Americans, I um, how they end up fighting over coffee is beyond me. You know, I mean, you understand it if people have had like 10 pints or whatever and it's closing time and a fight start. But how you can like, you know, load a fuff of a cappuccino and the next thing you know, you're outside having a bare knuckle thing. What kind of things are they falling out about? Like, what I don't understand for me, you're on this, you're in this beautiful island or, you know, in tropical paradise, you're in your 60s, you're retired, you know, you're, you're why would you? want to go around fighting other people at that stage of your life just want to chill out and relax well i'm going to stick out for mark now because um basically i think a few people have said over there on the comments i think it's a jealousy thing over there i think there are some americans over there who come there because and i'm saying about nothing against americans got american friends here i'm just saying that particular clip they are all americans um you know the, the ones that are falling out um some of them don't have a lot of money some of them have come here because they can't afford to live, you know, where they are. Um, and they've met women over here because they couldn't find women in their own country. But some of them have got a lot of money. And I think some of it's jealousy because certain people have opened resorts and all the rest of it. So I think it's something to do with that. Um, but basically, Mark, I've done three interviews for Mark's channel. And I've interviewed Mark twice for my channel. I say he's a big bloke, he's six foot. Seven, six, eight, so he's, he's, he's a big man. He's an old man, he's a big man. Um, and the first couple of times I met him and interviewed him, he was really happy go lucky. But I did a video, my first interview of him, I put the video up, and within about 10 minutes, it was like all this, like, you know, uh, cyber bullying. There were like, you know, all these trolls coming out, accusing him of the most awful things. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on here? Why are they, you know? And I said in my video, I started to think, well, there's no smoke without fire. No one I've ever interviewed. I've interviewed some quite high profile uh, bloggers. I've never had a response like that. So I started to think there's um, something wrong with the guy. But I didn't want to judge. I met him again a couple of months later, did another interview with him. Same thing happened. All this abuse. He's done this, he's done that. So I, at the end of the day, the guy was kind enough to sit down and do an interview with me. I thought, I'm not going to let people say that. About him, but I don't want to cherry pick what's acceptable and what's not. But some of them are saying, like, he's a bullshit and he's arrogant and he's a liar. I think, well, that's okay. 
But accusing someone of doing other things, you know, isn't okay. So rather than, you know, feel like I was censoring things, I just cut the comments off. And from that moment onwards, I got comments in all my other videos accusing me of doing the same things. You know, I'm a pedophile, I'm this and that, and, you know, I'm gay and I had lady boys and all that. So I realised straight away that it wasn't, I don't believe any of the allegations against Mark now. I believe they've fallen out over certain things because I know I haven't done any of that stuff. And it was the same, you know, profiles that were accusing me that were accusing him. And he had told me that day that um that uh, that when we'd done an interview that people had cloned his because he used to get on really well. He's been banned from Ground Zero now. But the coffee shop that he used to do his interviews, he knew the owners and he could go in there and he'd get the music switched off and that. Someone had made a profile of him and put it on TripAdvisor and said it was a terrible cafe and had made complaints and done Google reviews. So he'd have to go and apologize for all this. And you could tell Mark was stressed and his channel, a few of the things that it was dropping. So these people who were after him were having an effect on him. I suspect I know who one of them was, or I think, but I don't know, so I'm not going to name him. Um, but he's active in a resort and another guy's back in financial. Anyway, I'm not just going to ignore that. But I think that was the catalyst to the fight. You know, they had pushed Mark to a level where he had, and I think he obviously had an idea who had been doing it. Um, and that's how the, the, the fight took place. And Mark basically beat the shit out of this guy. As I understand it, I wasn't there, but that's what he said in his video. He's been banned from the coffee shop now, so he does his interviews. I think he does them in the Henry looking at the... Um, and uh, that's that. But you've got to wonder... What kind of a click is that when they're drinking coffee and they're making up false profiles? And, you know, it's a strange lot. I've always stayed away from x black clicks for the reasons I've said. I don't want to have to take sides and things. But I've never seen anything like that. And from the first interview onward, people were sending me messages like, you know, on things saying, you don't realise he's done this and this guy lied about that and he damaged his business. And I kept saying to people, look, when you've got a YouTube channel, you don't want to fall out with people and lose subscribers and things. So you're, like, nice and saying, like, I mean, well, okay, I understand you might have a problem with him, but I'm nothing to do with me. I don't know the guy you're talking about. And when the fight happened, the same people are saying, which side are you going to take now? And, you know, you see we were right all along. For God's sake, I have no interest in this. You know, I don't, I don't understand why. You know what I mean? If, would you email people and start, you don't know, and start telling them about, you know, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange business. All I'll say is uh, don't drink too much coffee. <laughs> you see, it seems to do bad things uh, you know, to your brain. You spent time in Pathia and you met uh, lots of different characters there. One guy was called Scammer Dave. Let's call this one Scammer Dave in Pathia and the precious metal scam. You take it away. Tell us all about it. He wasn't called Scammer Dave. He was called Dave. I mean, you can call him that if you like. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. <laughs> that wasn't his nickname. Um, yeah, Dave. Uh, Dave was a character. He, uh, I'll say from the outset, I like Dave, regardless of what happens. But um, he was uh, he was a big Geordie fella, um, and he was a, he was a big man. He's like about six foot uh, six foot four, you know, really really wide, um, intimidating figure, intimidating figure. And uh, he had a reputation because I I didn't know him. He, he, what he used to do is he used to go back to Newcastle, had a roofing business, and then he'd reappear for a few months and then disappear. So. When I first met him, he'd just come back over. Um, but everyone knew him in the bar, and they were telling me all these stories about when he got drunk, he had a fight with these Australians. And a lot of these Australians, for some reason, in Patia, well, not a lot, but some, have these uh, Thai bodyguards because they know they're going to get drunk and they might get in trouble. And he had a skull on the back of his head where he'd been hit with a stool and all this kind of shit. So the first time I met him, he immediately befriended me. Like, because I was sat at the bar, and when he came in, people were like, that's Dave, you know, you got to watch it. He sits down, he looks over at me and says, uh, I'm Dave. And I said, oh, you're a geezer, you are I like. And he starts coming out. And he was like, I was wearing him for the first couple of hours. I thought, where is this guy? But um, we hit it off. You know, we, we had a good night and that. Met him a couple of times um, in the bar. Um, but then he got really friendly with that guy, Barry, that I told you about, um, who had the uh, bar and hotel, ultimately. He didn't have it at that stage. And I thought, they're an odd couple. Because... Uh, Barry was not the sharpest tool in the box by a long way, and not streetwise, and he had a lot of health issues and things. But they were like palling around all the time. Like whenever you see them, they were inseparable. And the girls in the bar used to laugh like, here comes Barry with his bodyguards. And I thought then it was a bit strange. 
But then about a week after that, I came in the bar one day and he's uh, working away on his laptop. He didn't look like a laptop kind of guy. And I'm like, uh, what are you doing there, Dave? He said, uh, I dabble in precious metals. I buy gold, silver, platinum, that kind of thing. Oh, really? He says, yeah. I says, how, how does that do for you? He says, oh, he does very well. I'm making, I'm making a lot of money. I said, how long have you been doing that for? He said, oh, a few months. I'm thinking, well, there's not many things you can just take up after a few months with making money. I mean, stocks and shares and things, it takes you a few years to find your, your way, but I didn't think much of it. But there was a guy over there who I've spoken about in some of the videos. Uh, I'll call him John, but I won't say anymore. Um, he was a very wealthy guy. He had a firework business in uh, Hong Kong and a lot of property in England. And he, I, personally, I thought he was an arsehole, excuse my French, but he, had a, he, he, he was a successful guy. You know, he obviously knew what he was doing. And he started uh, palling around with them. And then uh, one day I came in the bar and uh, I was talking to him about the, uh, just came out in conversation. They were celebrating and they were celebrating that they'd uh, had a result on the, uh, the gold and the, the silver. Web. I don't know what metals they were, but they reckon they were doing really well on the, on, on the old precious metals. And uh, because John was involved, that got me thinking. Because if it'd been the other two, it's not that I wouldn't have trusted them. I'd have thought, you know, I ain't giving money to them, the idiots, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but uh, as soon as I knew he was involved, John, and I thought, this is a strange thing. And about a week after that, I, I spoke to uh, Barry when he wasn't there. I said, how much money do you think you've made, Barry? And I can't remember what he said, but it was, it was several thousand over the last few weeks. And I think, again, it's a long time ago. Don't get me right on the figures. I think John had put 10,000 in and Barry had put 5,000 in. And I wasn't looking to invest in anything. But, you know, if an opportunity comes along, you think, well, why not have a dabble kind of thing? Um, and I thought about it. And a few days afterwards, I saw Dave in the bar. And I said to him, look, I might want to get involved in this, uh, this, this metal stuff, you know, that you're doing. Like, you know, how much would it cost me? And he said, no, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't. I said, well, we don't do it. Why, why can't? And he said, no, stay out of it. I said, but you don't want investment. I said, I don't want any investment. I don't want anything. Just don't ask me about it again. I think he's probably saying, like, you'll thank me one day or whatever. But uh, I was, um, I can't remember why I was there, but I was definitely living in Petchabon at the time, or I was moving up to Petchabon. But I wasn't permanently in Pattaya. So it was probably before I moved up there the first time. Because um, I left there thinking, you know, why isn't he like the kind of thing? You know, why is my money not good enough? Thought no more of it. Um, came back to Patia about three months after that. Because what I used to do is I used to do the visa runs. Um, there was a place there that you go over to Cambodian border, and it was a good chance for me to see my friends. So I'd come back for two or three days, um, do the visa run, and then go back up to uh, Petrovan. And I came back, uh, it was either for a visa run, or it was for, uh, no, it was for a visa run, definitely for a visa run. And we stayed at Barry's place. And I went in, the first thing I said to Barry was, uh, how are you doing on the old gold and silver like, you know, uh, are you millionaires yet? And he just dropped his face. He was like, you know, they've stolen our money. He's taken this and blah, 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 blah. We've lost everything. We haven't lost everything. You've still got the bar. He says, no, I've lost all the money we put in. It, 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 it's all gone. I said, but you can't blame Dave for that because, um, you know, these things happen like this. No, no, he's stolen it. He's stolen it. I mean, he's done, so he never invested it. He's just taken it. He's taken my money and he's taken John's money and he's gone back to Newcastle. So I was like, see, Barry was a strange fish. Like I said in the thing before, he'd never been upstairs on, you know, was like, so you take everything he says with a pinch of salt. And uh, I unpacked the gear and that went up. I was telling my girlfriend about it and she didn't have any particular interest, you know, in, in what had happened. Um, and I saw him that night, and he's uh, giving it a, how he's going to put a contract out on uh, Dave, and they're going to get him this, and they're going to get him that, and John's going to put the money in, and he knows people. I said, listen, Barry, don't be doing things like that. If you are going to do things like that, don't be talking about it in the bar, but if I was you, mate, I would think, be carefully about going after someone like Dave, just write the money off. You know, if you can afford How much did he lose? Uh, as I said, I think he lost about £5,000, but I couldn't swear that. But I'm sure that's what they said initially, that John had put 10 in and Barry had put 5 in. Whether they put more in after that, I don't know. But they'd lost at least that, at least that. And I mean, you know, like I say, I mean, John's probably the kind of guy who would put a contract out or something. I, I don't know. But if you're doing it, you don't tell everyone in the bloody bar, do you? <laughs> you know what I mean? 
like that. Um, and then late that evening, I said as a joke, I said, I'll tell you what, Barry, if I see him, you know, what do I get for like taking care of him or whatever? Will, 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 will you like, I get half the money, you know, like, and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm, of course, no interest in doing that. So just, just having a laugh for him, he's blonder. Um, never saw Dave. Went back to uh, Petrobon. Would have been three months later. Came back. I'm in the uh, old uh, beer place where they used to drink, where the Easy Bar used to be, but that had, that had now moved somewhere else. And I glanced over when I saw Dave, bold as brass. He was one on, on one of the on one of the other um, bars. And I looked at him, and a couple of the girls behind the bar, you know, girls like, "Oh, stay, 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 don't talk to him." Because I said, "That's Dave." And I was like, "No, it's not that. I've, I've, I like Dave." And he saw me about the same time I saw him. Um, and he called a big smile on his face and that. So we went over, like, and uh, we shook hands. And uh, afterwards, you know, he told me that um, they'd said to him, the girls behind the bar, like, you know, keep them away, keep them away, he's dangerous. So I didn't know, like, a lot of the talk was going on. Um, so I, like, had a chat with Dave, and, like, we're laughing and joking. And uh, I said to him, um, what's happened with uh, Barry and uh, John? And he, he's bold as brass. He said, I screwed him for the money. I, 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 I took my cash flow. He said, but, uh, you know, uh, you're not worried about, like, you know, like being back here and that, because I've heard they put a contract down. And he made some comment along the lines of, um, no one dare touch me because uh, I'm with, I've, I've, I've got protection. And I said, well, you don't need protection besides you. He said, well, you never know, like, and it was a guy, he said, meet my friends. And he was with a guy called Tim Shardy. He's a famous uh, Australian guy over there. He's Built like a brick shit house, covered in tattoos and all that. But he wasn't as intimidating as the guy I was with him. He's a little Australian guy. Um, he said, meet him. I shook his hand. My God, he was about my height, but he had hands like shovels. <laughs> I said to him, like, you know, uh, my foot have got a tight grip. And apparently he used to be a professional boxer or whatever. Um, and uh, we had a few beers. And, uh, John, you know, they, like, you know, he'd gone out. I said, well... Why did you do it to him? I didn't like him. I do it all the time. It's all I've done. It's all I do. It's what I do. So I come here, I go there, blah, 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 blah. He was a professional and, uh, fun man. He was a professional something because that in the late that night, I didn't mention it in the other video. He said, Do you want a job with us? I said, Doing what? He said, We'll pay you. He bought that a thousand pounds a month, a thousand pounds a week. And I said, For doing what? He said, just keeping your eye out, just, you know, keeping your eye out, you know, letting us know about things. So I'm thinking, no, you're right, Dave. I, so I never got to the bottom of what that, what, what that meant, <laughs> like, mm. what that job would have been, or whether it was just bullshit. Um, but no, he'd done, it, he'd, he'd done it a few times. And uh, he said that that's why he had, um, whether they were involved with two Australians or not, I don't know. But he was well aware that there were people after him. So we shook hands and that. We left on the, we left on good terms and, you know, that was that. Um, the next time we came back to uh, Patia, I asked about Dave. He was dead. He'd been stabbed. I think it was on, I think it was on Soy Diamond. But I couldn't swear to that. But yeah, someone had stabbed him, a Thai guy, they say. I don't know if the guy ever got caught for it. Dave being Dave, he had um, gone to the hospital. They'd saved him. They'd kept him in there for a uh, few weeks. And well, I thought it was, they kept him in for a while because it was a serious injury. And then they'd uh, discharged him, but they'd said that he couldn't drink alcohol. So I don't know if it was his spleen or, his, or whatever he got stabbed in. And I don't know if it was he could never drink alcohol again or he couldn't drink alcohol for a while. But apparently he came out of hospital first day, drank a bottle of vodka and died. He was dead within 24 hours. How old was he? I'd say he was late 30s, probably. Maybe oh. early 40s. Yeah, I'd, I'd, say, I'd say about 40-ish. Have you met many of those kind of characters, those con men in Thailand and Philippines and in your travels? I've met a few people that I thought I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. I've not met many days because uh, like, you don't get many of them to the pound. He was, he, was, he was a very unusual character. But I've never met anyone who's been as bold as brass and said, like, that's what I do and this is, you know, because you think, why the hell is he saying that to me? I mean, I'm going to tell other people that, you know, if he hadn't made it, he, you know, you usually keep that kind of thing... Uh, Quiet, but no, yeah, yeah. I met a lot of people I wouldn't trust, you know, a lot, but never anyone quite like him. Have you ever had anyone ask you for money? I've had people suggest stuff, yeah. I've had, you know, many times I've had that, but a lot of that were like Thai people would come up to you and say, you know, in the village I lived in, people would come around and see me with these investments and things and all that kind of stuff. And I'd probably say, no, I'm not, I'm not interested. In terms of scammers, there have been a few times where I thought, yeah, this guy's going to rip me off.
all the bad business plans. You know, the people like saying, let's open a restaurant together. Because I know nothing about restaurants. You know nothing about restaurants. What the hell are we open a restaurant for? You know what I mean? It's, uh... Well, let's talk about you then, right? So you have a YouTube channel. Now, I've seen you You started doing loads of interviews now. And your interviews are really good. So tell us, um, you know, what's your plan for your channel? And tell us about your interviews. Well, the channel is, um, speaking of Asia, um, it's uh, relatively new. I think I'm about five months into it now. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure what direction it's taking. I mean, some of it's main monologues has talked about my life experience, but I, I am doing more and more interviews. And I've started a thing now called Beach Bums, which is me and a couple of my expat mates. I mean, they rotate and people can ask us questions about, you know, the Philippines or Thailand or whatever. And, uh, you know, they just put it in the comments and then we'll talk about it, you know, in the next uh, video. Um, it's going OK. It's going OK. Hopefully it will get bigger and uh, better. I like your interviews, but I also like your stories as well, where it's just you like like this and you just tell a story. I think you should do more of them as well. The trouble is, don't be, I love doing those, but they don't get the views. <laughs> you know, the, the things I like doing, I don't get the views, but I will start doing more because I'm not really in it for the money. But, you know, when you when you see, you put an interview up with some guy who says he lives for less than $600 a month and that gets like 5,000 views, or you put like, you know, a beautiful Filipino, like one of my ex-girlfriends on there, she got 40,000 views. When you sit down there and tell your life story and you get 800 views, you think, what the hell am I doing here? No one's interested in me. <laughs> I'm going to stop. Gonna I know, stop. I know, I know. But but the thing is, you have to do, like, you have to mix it up. So you got to do videos that you, for you every now and then. So you might do five videos that you know are going to get views, and then on the sixth one, then you say, right, this one's for me. 100%, mate, 100%. I don't like chasing people for interviews. And if I was going to do the interviews full time, I'd have to be like Mark Thornton used to be, you know, stay all day in a bar just looking for people to interview. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't be doing that. So whether they, whether the viewers like it or not, there are a lot more monologues coming out. My views on the world. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, look, I'll link your channel down below and I'll put it, I'll tag you in it as well. Simon, you're a legend. I hope, I, I, maybe down the line, I have more ideas for more videos. Maybe in a couple of months' time, we could do... um like a proper video, like comparison Thailand versus the Philippines. We get more in depth into it and just cover more uh, of your life. And I'm sure you'll have updates on what you've been doing in the next couple of months anyway. So it'd be great to get you back on again. I would love to, mate. I've enjoyed it. Pleasure talking to you, mate. You're a good man. I, I, I love all this. I love to talk. <laughs> You're a great talker. It makes my job easier. <laughs> okay, Pete. Thanks a lot, mate. Be like Simon. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your day.